up next, we are heading to Knoxville, Tennessee. But really, we're traveling all up and down the Appalachian Mountains. I learned today how to say that. That's not Appalachia, it's Appalachian Mountains. Angela Denise, William Isom, and Nkeshi Alameen are here from East Tennessee PBS to talk to you about your preconceptions and misconceptions about Appalachia. Ooh, did I say it right? <laughs> We've heard all the stereotypes, right? We picture all the same things, white people. That's wrong. That undercuts the region's rich history and erases so many people, black people, like my grandmother. She's from that region. The next show is called Black in Appalachia, and it, and it is fighting that erasure with stories and conversations that highlight the black experience in part of the country where they are often invisible. Please welcome Angela and Keshi and William. Appalachia podcast, whoop, whoop. Uh, pronounced Appalachia, not Appalachia, as you may have heard earlier. So yeah, so we want to know where is this this uh, cultural phenomenon that they now call Appalachia? Where where is it? I don't know. In the mountains, Tennessee, Tennessee, Virginia. Virginia. West Virginia. West, Boondocks. West by God, Virginia. <laughs> All of West Virginia. <laughs> uh, and well, there is a there is a geographic definition of what Appalachia is. Tell us. Tell us about it. In 1965, the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is part of the federal government, mm -hmm. designated 13 states and 420 counties as Appalachia. Wow. During the war on poverty, mm -hmm. which they totally won. Sure they did, yeah. And so that definition includes uh, traditional places like Tennessee and West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Western North Carolina, but it also includes places that you wouldn't necessarily consider Appalachia, at least like I where? don't. Like where? Like Mississippi oh, or wow. New York State. Up oh. north. Up north. Uh, so this definition is based on a loose geography, but the primary definition, at least as far as the federal government goes, is based on poverty rates. So Appalachia is where poor people live? That's what they say. Huh, which, that's unfair. So those of us who are from the region, that's bullshit, right? So yeah. it leads me to want to know, like, what is Appalachia? Well, I would definitely say coal, coal country. Coal country? Um, Trump country. Opioids. Opioids. <laughs> Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton's down. Shout out to Dolly Parton. Down with the BLM. Down with yep. BLM. Uh, yeah. So, um, but culturally and politically. What about what about art and and literature? Literature. Yeah. What about black people? What about, about black, black people? people? <laughs> <laughs> so we hear all the time that black people don't live in Appalachia, right? Or at least they just got here recently, right? Um, that's a common misperception about this region. You know, people usually debate slavery and the presence of black people prior to the Civil War. We always hear, well, the topography. Topography. You know, like I said, the, <laughs> the topography didn't allow for slavery, right? But we know that that's not true, right? For as long as white folks have been in Appalachia, Y'all, Black folks have been here, too. yes, right? <laughs> and so slavery may have looked differently in terms of plantation sizes and the types of work that people did, 
but it was very much alive and well and shaped what we know as Appalachia today, right? And then after the Civil War, during the Industrial Revolution, um, with the rise of coal, the coal industry and the railroad industry, we saw an influx of Black people into the coal mining areas of places like Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia, right? So coal mining companies would uh, recruit, recruit aggressively in, uh, in parts of the South, in the Deep South, places like Alabama, right? They would right. send down, like, almost smugglers to places like <laughs> Alabama to <laughs> smuggle Black people to work as um, in these coal fields, right? So by the early 1900s, we had tons, thousands of Black people in Appalachia, right? In West Virginia alone in, 13, in the early 1900s, we had 80,000 80, plus Black folks, mm -hmm. um, and, and most of them were yeah. Uh, in the coal mines. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So, um, so my understanding is that even though a lot of them migrated in and out of the region, that a lot of them stayed for work purposes, school, and various other reasons. Um, so they've been kind of moving in and out of the region over the last um, few generations. Yeah, and so the work we're doing with the Black and Appalachia podcast and the initiative in general is really to challenge misconceptions of this region and highlight the stories of Black people in and through Appalachia, right? So stories of people whose families uh, have been in the region prior to the Civil War, great migration and out-migration stories, stories of people who have come to the region in the contemporary period. Yeah, right. my family goes way back, but how did y'all get here? So, in Keshi. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up only about four hours away from Knoxville in the Atlanta area, right? But before coming to, before coming here, I knew absolutely nothing about Knoxville and damn sure didn't know nothing about Appalachia, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I remember like when I got here feeling like something was strange about this place, like foreign, <laughs> and I couldn't articulate what it was, right? I remember y'all, the first time I came to Knoxville, I was coming for a grad school interview and I was living in, living in New York at the time. So my flight from New York to Knoxville connected in Atlanta. And if any of you have ever traveled to Knoxville, you know that any flight to Knoxville is a small ass 50 seater, <laughs> right? Tiny ass plane that you're not sure you're gonna make it, right? right. <laughs> and so I'm like one of the last passengers to board this plane. I get on, and I look out like, you know, like I'm standing at the head of the plane and I look out and all I see is a sea of whiteness. <laughs> and all of the crazy <laughs> alien music it's comes like on in out. my head. Right, exactly. And I'm like, what the hell? Where am I going, right? Um, of course, my interview went well and I got into grad school and I moved here. And despite some very interesting experiences, I have grown an affinity for this region and especially for Black people in Appalachia. You said that you go way back. Tell yeah, us tell about us this about way back yeah. in this. Yeah, so my family's <laughs> been in in the, in the region for like six generations in like a, a hundred mile stretch in southwestern Virginia and East Tennessee for a very, very long time. And yeah, so we've been here for for a very, very long, long time. Mm, okay. Yeah, so what about you, Angela? So my story is interesting. So I started out here in Knoxville where I was born and then we kind of like migrated to Florida. So um, I kind of lost my Appalachian identity and then about 12 years ago, I moved back to Knoxville and here I am. Welcome, Welcome home. home. Welcome home. <laughs> Welcome home. All right, so y'all know who I am. You know who he is and who she is. We all know who each other <laughs> are. Like, like we know each other. Let's talk podcast. The reason we are all here today. So we've started and we've already learned so much. So we're going to be talking about stories on the podcast from contemporary to everything in between. We'll be talking about the history of the Highlander Center, the historic election of Amelia Parker, and some of the work that the young um, organizers in Appalachia are doing. Yeah, so recently we learned about sundown towns in Appalachia right? Specifically, we learned about Corbin, which is a small town near the East Tennessee, Kentucky border on the Kentucky side. Um, so Corbin used to be a sundown town, and sundown towns are places where Black people were not allowed past sunset, right? So once the sun went down, they had to get the hell up out of there, right? <laughs> and so there would be these huge signs, like this is how people knew this was a sundown town. There would be these huge signs like at the town's entrance or some main road leading up to the town. And they would read some version of, <clears throat> <coughs> nigger, don't let the sun set on your black ass in blank town, right? And we know that in, in East Tennessee, there was one of these sundown towns that had this big ass donkey, right? 
um, I don't know if it had any words, but this was this big old donkey <laughs> on, a, on, a, on the top of a mountain somewhere. And folks know, like, you know, they might tell you now that it was something else, but people knew what that donkey signified, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and in post-Reconstruction America, these, these types of towns weren't just in the traditional South. They were also in a lot of those in the Midwest, Indiana, in uh, Chicago, Chicago I mean, right. Illinois. out West, uh, and in the Northeast. I mean, you think about like, you know, right now is the anniversary of Yusef Hawkins' murder in a, mm -hmm. in, New, in a New York neighborhood. Right. So these sundown towns were all over the place. Here in our region, uh, places like Irwin, Tennessee, Grundy, Virginia, and Corbin, Kentucky, uh, which incidentally is the home of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Say it himself. Say it, it himself. Is. <laughs> and, and Corbin, Kentucky is one of those places that once I started driving, my dad gave me the talk like, like we, we, we don't go over there. Like right. you don't go over there. Y'all, William doesn't listen to his dad. And <laughs> he, funny enough, he took us over to Corbin. We all went down to, or went up. We did go over We there. went over to Corbin. Yes, we did. And so after our visit, uh, we wanted to learn more about Corbin. So we found out that 7,200 people in Corbin is 0.05% uh, of them are black. So we put that in the calculator and that equaled 3.6% black people living in Corbin. Say that again, Angela, for Three, people in the back. <laughs> 3.6 black people living in Corbin. So we wanted to see if we could find one of these black people from Corbin. And to our surprise and my Facebook, we did. Y'all, her Facebook stays lit, <laughs> okay? Like, how cool would it be if we found, you know, like one of those black people from Corbin? What if I did? Shut up. <laughs> now I'm dead ass serious. You what found, you if found, I did? You found the black people in Corbin. Sort of. The like 0. 0.6. What do you mean? Like she's biracial. But she lives in Corbin. You found out you found you found our point six. Yes. You okay. know my Facebook stays lit. So I had decided to make a post the other day. Uh -huh. And I just asked everyone on my friends list, does anyone know anyone in Corbin, Kentucky? And I actually got some responses and they tagged this one girl in particular named Camilla. Get out. Yeah, so she's the point six. Wow. Okay, so what does Camilla have to say about Corbin? Like, how did she end up there? Hello. Hey, it's Angela. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. So we just wanted to call you because we are doing a podcast on Black okay. History in Appalachia. You said you currently live in Corbin, is that correct? I do. I've lived in Corbin for about three and a half or four years. My husband and I decided that we were going to move to Corbin and, and you know, uh, to buy a home and kind of put some roots down. And I remember telling, you know, telling our parents and my dad, he just kind of, at first, he kind of looked a little shocked, a little sh look of shock on his face. And, and he said, you know, Corbin, Corbin used to be bad. The one thing that he said he always remembered is there was a certain point this way that my grandfather would, would turn the truck around because it literally said no in words allowed right. across, across a bridge. And, and he said that that's just something that's always stuck with him. And so I think he was just scared for us. But he, he was just like, it used to be really bad and I just worry about you, you being safe. So if you are curious to know more about Camilla's story or more about Corbin, um, how it became a sundown town and what it's doing to repair, repair its ugly history, and it is ugly, you'll want to listen to our podcast. And lucky for you all, this episode, <laughs> this very episode that you just listened to is live. We just released it last Saturday on the 22nd. <laughs> so we just released this episode. It is live and you can subscribe and listen. Okay. Uh, black and Appalachian the podcast is about is a podcast about black people, black places, and black experiences, both historical and contemporary in Appalachia. And it's made for people who are from the region, people who have familiar ties to the region. Shout out to Kai Wright. And people who just want a fuller <laughs> understanding of what it means to be uh, black in Appalachia. To learn more about the Black in Appalachia initiative and of course our podcast, you can check us out on the web. We are blackinappalachia.org. <laughs> And if you're on the socials, you'll want to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We are Black in Appalachia. Um, I'm in Keshi. I'm William. And I'm Angela. And we are the, the Black, Black in Appalachia, Appalachia Podcast. Podcast. Woo! Woo!